session. Um, today we're gonna do a guided tour here and um, Delia Lake is uh, being very generous that she's giving us these tours for a couple of semesters back. Uh, she has been giving those tours to our students and now uh, in our uh, ISB course uh, this is one of the week that we arranged with Delia. She's going to give us a tour of her island here. This island is going to uh, be very interesting for us because it's talking about sustainability and as well as the ecosystems crashing, how ecosystems are uh, in the real world and how we are kind of uh, destroying it as people and uh, humanity. So uh, she's going to give us some examples, living examples of it in the virtual world. Uh, she has a lot of nice builds here and she's giving us a really informative tour. Uh, the only challenge here is we need to follow her. Sometimes it's tricky, so if you get lost or if you can't follow it, just I am us that we will teleport you to the location. Uh, so that you will be able to follow uh, even when you get lost. Try to focus on uh, what, what she's saying and try to focus on follow her as much as you could uh, in SL, then uh, we will also try to help you. Okay, thank you Delia again hosting us. And, and welcome everyone. We have set up an island here that is uh, has a lot of representations of real world ecosystems. And there are also displays in in the sky above here. So I do encourage people to take a landmark and come back because you cannot possibly see everything that is here in a two hour tour. Um, there is a lot of science and environment here in this small location. Before we go any further, uh, let me say a couple of things. One is um, I will be mostly in voice because uh, it's harder to swim and point things out and type at the same time. I will try to speak slow enough that um, Magua and some of you can translate. But please do stop me if you um, are having trouble understanding. You want me to say something again or um, type something, I will be glad to do that. But I will not know if you don't tell me. For some of the ecosystems, there are note cards. Uh, so I will pass you note cards if you cannot get them from the signs. That being said, um, I have spent the last uh, now 17 years here in Second Life, building ecosystems. And I've done that because my solid world, real life, is focused on issues of sustainability. That's my work. We as human beings have become very disconnected, separated from the ecosystems that support our very life. 
this is not smart for human beings. So I have built these ecosystems to help people have an experience to reconnect with some of the natural world. And here in the Abyss Observatory, particularly the coastal and near shore marine ecosystems. I've done this because we all can read about ecosystems, but you don't get the same sense of them reading about them as you do if you are immersed in any of them. So, we will walk across the bridge behind me. We will go first to a tropical coast area and a tropical coral reef. You can either walk along a tunnel or you can click on a swimmer, uh, jump on the ball, touch the ball that will appear, and swim. Swimming will give you more of an experience than walking through the tunnel, but you can do either one. Um, after we go to the tropical area, we will go to a temperate underwater area. We won't walk through the temperate coastal area, but you can do that at home because most of us live in a temperate uh, climate. I live in the United States. You are in Turkey and other places, Ireland, other places in the world, but we are all northern hemisphere temperate for the most part. But you can come back to look at those. After the temperate, <clears throat> including a kelp forest, we will continue around undersea to a subarctic cold water coral reef. And all of the kinds of animals that live in those places. So if you do get lost, just continue around from south to uh, east to north. But I will try to look behind me and make sure that people are able to follow. Okay, so let's walk across the bridge.
the ships that we passed walking along the bridge are replicas of actual real world research ships. So the Calypso, Calypso and the uh, Okanos are actual research ships that go out and collect the data that make it possible for us to know about these areas. Right now, right here, where we are standing on these planks, on this platform, we are in a mangrove forest. Mangroves are um, plants that are salt tolerant. At one time, they were all around the, um, the world. And they, <clears throat> they have been um, removed for coastal building. The problem is that the mangroves not only filter the salt water, their roots, if you look down, you'll see that their roots are thick and stand up off the, the sand. So they provide a habitat for many other creatures to live, um, to safely grow. And they also are strong enough to be a stormwater barrier so that when the huge storms that come and hit our coasts now, um, hit the mangrove forest first, it slows the water. Without the mangroves, the water hits all uh, full strength all of the buildings that we have put there. So this is the first thing that I'd like you to think about when you think about um, what humans, what people build along the coast. Are we making it so that what we build is at risk because we have removed the protections? We will walk down the stairs onto the beach and look around. Take a minute, look all around the sand. What do you see here? Yeah, John, you're going to have to stretch out your leather shoes when you're done. What animals do you see here? Seagulls, yes. An egret, yes.
Yes. There are many kinds of crabs that live in mangrove forests. This particular one is representative of a number of tropical coastal areas. But it is not identical to any of them. So yes, you have snakes. Um, look just beyond ginger to ginger's left shoulder. And what do you see in the tree? Blue crabs that live in mangroves climb trees. You don't think about, I don't think about crabs as tree dwellers, but some of them are. Um, if you look behind all of us also, you will see crocodiles. So every habitat has some predator animals and some prey animals. And often what is prey for one animal will be the predator of another animal. This is what keeps habitats in balance. You'll also see grasses and um, seaweed of different kinds. For millions of years, the mangroves have helped build land. Be I say that because the roots of the mangrove catch not only the silt, but the dead and decaying animals and the plants. And little by little, as that decomposes, new land is built. So, any questions before we go undersea? Yes. Mostly I do not make them. And this is a choice I made in Second Life. I can build and make things. But there are people here in Second Life who make their actual living by building and selling animals, plants, furniture, buildings, uh, vehicles. And so I choose to buy them when I can. That, I do have to search for that. I have, uh, you know, if you 
click on any of the uh, objects to edit, you will see that they come from many different producers so that I do have to search for ones that are realistic. Um, and then combining these into ecosystems is a lot like doing a puzzle or an artwork. And again, uh, for every ecosystem, I want to make sure there are enough um, of the predators and prey and enough of the vegetation to be representative. We can never build a complete ecosystem in Second Life. It would be so um, resource intensive so far as computer use goes, it would be impossible. Every real life ecosystem is highly complex. So I choose what I consider to be keystone species, ones that are uh, give the ecosystem its characteristics and that without those species, the whole ecosystem would lose integrity. It would be out of balance and wouldn't work. So that's how I go about designing these. And this design principle, though, is a good uh, way to look at any of the real life habitats you see, whether it is walking in a a uh, park in real life or going on into a nature preserve um, or anything else. Look for what are the plants and animals that make this area, this habitat possible to maintain itself. No, that is correct, uh, Magua. You brought up a good point. That, uh, and I did talk, I was talking then about ecosystem restoration. And you will probably read a lot about that. For the most part, it is not possible to restore an ecosystem unless it is you only a small bit of it has been removed because once you break down the integrity of an ecosystem you have changed the character and you have changed the balance of prey and predator, you have changed the way the food system cycle works. And two things happen, basically. One is that when a key predator is removed, either you get a enormous growth of prey that overrun the ecosystem and eat all the food or another predator or set of predators moves in so that space is then gone 
this has happened when we have killed off um, the primary predators in any of the real world ecosystems, whether it is wolves or bears or lions and tigers or sharks or you know, you name it, any of the um, primary predators that we humans didn't want to live around, when we have killed them off, the ecosystem that they were an integral part of is broken down. And when you restore them, you may get a similar ecosystem, but you will never get the same one again. Think of it like a kaleidoscope. If you look at a beautiful pattern through a kaleidoscope and you turn the lens a little bit, a slightly different pattern comes up. If you turn it backwards, the lens, if you turn it the other direction, you never get the old pattern back. You will get something that looks similar, but you will never get the old one back. That's the way it is with ecosystems, too. So when you read about restoring, it's not really restoring. It, is, it doesn't bring it back. It just makes it possible to have something similar. So what Magua just said, it's very complex and it's very important to protect the critical ecosystems that we have. Do we have other questions before we go underwater? Good idea. Yes. So if you are using the tube, you walk through over here, and this will take you all around the perimeter of this island, that tube. If you want to swim and you click on a swimmer yes you get the ball and you touch the ball and sit on it yes just like that and do page down or arrow down to go below You should be able to dive with page down.
we are now in an entirely different environment. Take a minute here to get yourself oriented. What do you see around you? Jellyfish, yes. And close to the jellyfish, an ocean sunfish, sometimes it's called a uh, mola mola. So the mola, the favorite food of the mola is jellyfish. So in this case, I have placed the prey and the predator close together. tropical coral reef. We've known about tropical reefs for millennia, thousands of years. Tropical reefs are not only beautiful, but they are also home to many, many, many species. Tropical coral reefs are found around the world on tropical coastal areas. So um, this again is not any particular area but it is representative of many of them. So it could be off Africa, it could be anywhere in the Indian Ocean, it could be Indonesia, it could be Central and North, the North Coast of South America, it could be off Africa, This is a typical coral reef. So corals are really the, the cornerstone habitat of the tropical oceans. They, although corals look like they would be plants, they are not plants. They are animals. And these animals have um, calcium carbonate uh, structures. They're, they're not bones, but they're, they're um, framework and structure. And the soft part of the coral grows on that. When the coral the living coral dies, it leaves behind the uh, calcium carbonate structure 
and so you will see the coral here is sitting on top of the light gray or white rocky looking coral framework. This is generations of coral, thousands and thousands and thousands of years to build a coral reef. So this is why you may have read in the uh, headlines over the years that the great coral reef off Australia when it was dying, people were so upset because it takes a very long time to bring back a coral reef. And it's not only one species. There are many species here that live together. There are also many kinds of fish. There are marine mammals like uh, the dolphins and porpoises that you see here. You will see uh, occasional whale that will come through. There's also octopus. There are some shellfish. It is a very, very rich habitat. Um, it looks like, it appears that the coral are all different colors. While we see the coral as colored, the colors are not the properties of the coral themselves. The coral, the tropical coral, hosts algae. It hosts different kinds of um, algae that live within the corals and provide the color. Why would they do that? The algae is protected inside the coral and the algae provides the photosynthesis that feeds the coral. So this is a symbiotic relationship. When the water gets too hot, though, the coral expel the algae, throw the algae out. If the water cools off quick enough, the al some algae will come back to the coral. But without the major food source, without the algae, the coral will eventually die off. And this is what is happening when you read about the coral reefs leaching. This is why it was so upsetting, not only with the Great Barrier Reef in um, off Australia, the north of Australia, but also recently this year in the uh, the Caribbean. So, off the state of Florida, they had uh, research and uh, test protected coral areas where they were growing uh, rare tropical corals. And the storms and the heated water this year was killing off the coral. So researchers had to dive and collect little bits of species from those reefs, take them into the laboratories 
to try to save them so that they were not going to be extinct. Because some of them were very rare. Uh, it seems to be working. The water is still hot in the Caribbean, but it is not as hot as it was. It was up to, and I, I'm not going to do the, um, the Celsius translation well, but it was like 95 degrees Fahrenheit, the water temperature, 90 and 95 degrees Fahrenheit, which is much, much too hot for ocean water. In addition to the heating of the water, yes, it is. It, it's in that uh, range, Magua, yes. Um, but in addition to the heating of the water, the oceans absorb a lot of the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. So we hear a lot about the atmospheric heating and the um, increase in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, but seldom do we get that a lot of the carbon dioxide is taken up by the absorbing into the oceans. What that does is make the water more acid. So how does that affect the coral? Remember I said that the structure of the coral, the uh, skeleton, so to speak, of the coral is calcium carbonate, carbonate, so when the water becomes more acid, the skeletons tend to weaken and sometimes dissolve. So this is killing the coral also. It's like if you drink a lot of, if you would drink something highly acid or sugar and never brush your teeth, your teeth would decay. So that's the same thing that is happening to the coral structures. They're decaying from the acid water. Are there questions before we leave the tropical area? And I do invite you to return here and just Stay here for a little bit and see what you notice that you might have missed this time. Yeah, the relationship between the animals and the oxygen in the ocean is really, really important. And that is uh, with all of the different habitats here.
So let's, um, and, and I'm, I must say, there is also coral, and we'll talk a little bit more about it. Um, there is coral in the Mediterranean as well. But it's not all of these tropical corals. Um, a lot of the coral um, in the Mediterranean is deeper so that you don't have the, the same photosynthesis. It's uh, uh, 80 meters deep or deeper. And there are research coral reefs off uh, the coast of France, for instance. And they're also worried about those because the Mediterranean is too hot. I'm going to move along into the temperate habitats, but watch as you go along. What do you see? What changes do you notice? Okay. I'm 
waiting here okay so I stopped here because this area where I am now is more typical of what you would see in the coastal uh, temperate area. It is what you would find off North America, um, the east coast of North America, but it is also what you would find if you did um, snorkeling in the Mediterranean similar not exactly but the coral I was talking about that is off France if you look you'll find right up here the red uh, gargonian and that's the kind of coral that you see in that red orange coral jewelry and that is found in the Mediterranean. The other thing that you find a lot in these coastal areas is grasses, eel grasses particularly. Um, and these grasses are nurseries for um, many small fish and also shellfish. They, people don't like to swim in them. They don't like the feel on their legs. So they are uh, removed. But uh, the crabs and uh, clams and um, any of the shellfish are spawned in this kind of grass. So when you remove the grass, you are reducing the population of the things we like to eat. Not very smart, actually. Okay. Now we can move over to the We can move over to the um, kelp forest. Kelp forests are also temperate. So although these are called forests, they're not trees. What do you think kelp is? What might this be? Kelp is, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Incidentally, we do get uh, some information from uh, some of the some of the uh, the shows that we've watched, don't we? Yeah. So, kelp looks like a tree, looks like a plant. It is algae. Kelp is brown algae. It is found in the 
temperate coastal areas and more. We used to think that it was only uh, coastal. We have recently found many more um, areas of kelp in the world, very recently. It will grow um, up as far as the subarctic and it will grow as far as the uh, near Antarctic, but it will not go where the water freezes. That will kill the algae. So you find it um, in the temperate areas around the world. Um, Kelp has been in the news recently because they are now um, trying to use kelp as a bioenergy source. It grows quickly. It can be farmed. So it can be grown by farmed it is, can be grown along ropes that are strung underwater. Um, to take a minute about the structure of the kelp, it looks like this is roots and uh, trunks and leaves. It is not. It is differentiated functions of that algae uh, that have what looks like roots are hold, called holdfasts that are like sticky strings that uh, so it doesn't float away all the time. It will float. And the, um, the stipes look like stems or trunks, but they're not. And then the uh, blades that look like leaves are really air bladders, have air bladders in them, so they float. Um, yeah, and they are, you know, kelp is edible. All around the world, people eat kelp. Um, and it's pretty tasty. So um, it's also used in skincare and cosmetics, and it's used not only to be eaten by itself, but as an emulsifier that gives a thickness to many, many food products. So if we suddenly lost all the kelp, we would have a big production problem with many of our uh, processed foods. So what are some of the animals that you see here? Yes. Yes. Yes, it's not only that. It's a number of uh, emulsifiers um, that are used. So it is uh, the algin, it is the carotene, it is the... Um, uh, it's used in toothpaste. It's used in uh, thickeners of all kinds of foods. And yes, it is the agar that uh, is used for the gelatinous uh, growth medium for bacteria in the labs. And so it has many, many, many uses.
So we've talked about prey and predators here all, all along. Uh, yeah, I, I, let me stop and address what Magua asked. Yes, they are now farming kelp. They're doing that in Europe. They're doing that in North America. And they set up what looks like uh, long ropes. And then they, the kelp grows quickly. So if they put some kelp along the rope, it will, um, it will grow into long fronds. Yes. Which they can then harvest. And they've been doing this for a very long time. Um, for food sources, but they are also now trying to do this for um, bioenergy. Um, there's another very recent thing that they have found out about studying kelp, and this happened this was researchers off New Zealand that discovered this. Uh, and as I said, kelp is uh, temperate, but not freezing water. And if it's in too hot water, it will die. If it's in too cold water, it will die off. So they were doing testing on kelp. Um, off New Zealand and different beds and they found something interesting. They And they discovered this because there was a, um, a an earthquake and a tsunami. And it raised the this particular coastal area about six meters and the kelp all died. So that got them thinking about other places where there had been tsunamis, and they went to check some of the um, coastal areas that they knew. In checking a lot of them over a few years, they found that some of the kelp, the DNA, was very diverse, and some of them areas, the DNA was very homogeneous. So when they did further research and looked at what they could tell from the geology and what they could tell from the core samples of the climate, they discovered that the um, mix of diversity of DNA in kelp, whether it is highly diverse or very uh, homogeneous, would tell them a lot about the repopulation of kelp areas. So that the diverse ones had been stable for a long time, but the areas where the kelp, and particularly bull kelp, because there are different kinds, um, were all the same. Those were the newer areas, and either they had gone through geologic upheaval or they had been killed off by the uh, glaciation and the cold and had repopulated by invading kelp all coming back um, and all being the same. Because the glaciation had killed off 
not only the kelp and the other seaweed, but all of the predators of the kelp. So that the single DNA species could take hold rapidly. Um, which leads us to another piece of the conversation here about prey and predator. You'll see lots of species here because, again, it is a protected area and nursery for lots of different marine species. So you will see, for instance, bluefish chasing mackerel. Um, and the, the mackerel, the sardines, the herring uh, are a class of fish that are a keystone species worldwide. Um, but if you look closely, you will also see sea urchins. Mostly it is purple and red sea urchins that live among the kelp. And they When the ecosystem is in balance, the urchins will feed off the dead fronds, the, the uh, detritus of the kelp. But when the ecosystem is out of balance, the, which means there are no predators for the sea urchins, then they overpopulate and they start eating the live kelp and they can clear cut, remove an entire bed of kelp in a very short time. So here, luckily, in this ecosystem, we have predators for the sea urchins. What eats the sea urchins? The um, otters, the sea otters. You will see otters swimming around here. You will also see uh, that the some uh, sunflower starfish that are swimming uh, that are on the um, the the sand surface. They eat the sea urchins. Sheephead fish, large lobsters, all eat sea urchins. And so you will find all of this, those in this area to keep the ecosystem in balance. The sign that you are near that says kelp forest, that should give you a note card about some of this if you touch the sign. If it isn't working, which sometimes Second Life is strange that way, you know, I can give you the note card. Okay. Good. So the other thing I want to mention is that they have found deep uh, in the Mediterranean, they have found new kelp beds as well. Part of the Mediterranean, as you probably know, is very deep. It's like five thousand meters, eight thousand meters, very deep, very cold. And they have found both coral 
and kelp very deep in the Mediterranean recently. Um, some of the more recent is, I believe, in the Adriatic. Before we move on to the next area, are there other questions? Yes. Okay, that that's yeah that yeah, yeah that's a yeah some some uh, marine edible uh, species are now farmed, but they it, it's not a simple answer here, Sidon, and that's because um, all right so. Let me back up a little bit. What I didn't mention, because I talked about the carbon dioxide, but I didn't mention that uh, places like the kelp forests and the coral um, are, in addition to being um, affected by the carbon dioxide, the, uh, they are also carbon sinks, so that the kelp takes up a whole lot of carbon. When you, it's like a land-based forest in this sense, when you remove it, you are also releasing the stored carbon. So um, that, what you do with the entire cycle matters. So if you remove from the ocean and don't put back into the ocean, or you remove from the ocean and let it lay to disintegrate in the air, you are going to be releasing the carbon again. And this is a problem. Um, yeah, balance is critical. And thinking about this in terms of entire systems is critical. So um, if you are taking out, what are you giving back so that the, the um, ecosystem is not depleted? That's the first thing, because it's really, really, really important. So can we farm? Yes, we can farm. The kelp grows quickly. Not all of the marine animals grow quickly. But the problem comes, um, again, in a sense of balance. Because when you are farming, they tend to um, not look at the feeding and the waste removal from a system's perspective. And they may feed the farmed fish, for instance, um, waste products from uh, land animals. That is not their natural food. 
And so that does not give them the kind of um, nutrition that they need to be healthy so that these farmed animals could be healthy, but they, for the most part, are not because they haven't looked at what it takes to keep an ecosystem in balance. And that that's causes problems when some of the creatures escape their, their cages as well, escape their boundaries, because then you are diluting the natural um, resource pool of that species with less healthy ones. And that has happened, for instance, with the um, Atlantic salmon all along the coast of North America, there is no more native of Atlantic salmon. Um, that is also happening with some of the Pacific salmon now. So uh, the other thing with the salmon, for instance, when you look at the flesh of salmon, it looks a red orange color. That's not because it grows that way. Um, it's because the muscles of the salmon that have to swim in the currents are stressed. And this is a good kind of stress. It's like when we do a lot of exercise. And the color comes from the uh, having to do that kind of stress. So farm salmon, and they are often farmed in pools on constructed pools on land. Their flesh is white. People do not see that as salmon. So what is done then is the producers add red food color to make it look like it's natural and it isn't. Um, so the farming of most marine species is done, in my opinion, very haphazardly without considering what the effects are on the entire ecosystem. So that's a very long and incomplete answer, Sidearm. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Kelp uh, and other seaweed along the coastal areas for oh, thousands of years has been collected and used as fertilizer. What the, the kelp that wash uh, any of the seaweed that washes up on the, the uh, or most of it that washes up on the uh, sand above the high water mark. Um, has been collected and used as fertilizer on land. Um, the problem comes and when you have some of the um, seaweed or algae that is normally not coastal, um, that is overgrown by, and this is again a system cycle, um, and you get 
when you over fertilize any of our agricultural areas and they the runoff goes into the coastal waters you then have a an overpopulation of uh, particularly uh, cyanobacteria types that are come live in algae so you have the the red tide algae and that's poisonous um, and uh, it will also infest the the clams and the uh, some of the seafood that we would otherwise eat and make the clams and oysters inedible to us as well as a, a danger to us and other marine mammals who are in that coastal water when we have those uh, red tide episodes. But every summer around the world you will find dead zones that come from the runoff of excess fertilizer and um, then you have the algae blooms and the die-off because there is not sufficient food sources naturally to support them. And that then not only poisons the water, but it sucks out all of the oxygen as these um, algae um, are decaying. So um, this is what causes the dead zones in the coastal areas around the world. See, it's, it's all related, interrelated, and all uh, systems within systems within systems. So beginning to think within systems and the effects that different um, removals and additions and changes have is extremely important to sustainability. I'm going to continue to swim through here and go into the subarctic area um, along with the migrating whales that have been alongside of us all this time. The, the um, humpback whales, the blue whales, they migrate thousands of miles. I just hit a, a, a great white shark. Luckily, it ate enough. If you pause here in this, uh, hub area and look down, way down, you will see a, um, a hot thermal vent and you will see lots of different critters that live in the hot thermal vents that are all along the mid-Atlantic and mid-Pacific ridges. Um, they are finding more and more of these um, and they support an entirely different kind of ecosystem that is deep, way deeper than any sunlight will ever reach. So it is chemical synthesis, it is not photosynthesis that supports this life um, form, these life forms. Um, these are the... Um, they're very hot right at the center and then slowly um, the water cools off because the water is very cold and very deep here. <coughs> You'll find a remarkable number of species though and ones that you would think 
would be delicate, like glass fish. Um, and, but the pressure is so strong here that to do research on these, you cannot bring them up to the surface. They will pop. Yeah, yeah those are our uh, tube worms, side harm. The, the, they look like matchsticks. They're, they are tube worms. And they live uh, right around the thermal vents. You'll also see squid not lot, not um, octopus, but squid, relatives, and you'll see uh, sperm whales. You'll see different kinds of. Who knew that jellyfish could withstand this kind of extreme pressure? Human beings could not. The only time that people have gone down here have been in submersibles and not all that far because the pressure is so great it even will explode some of the sub submersibles. So this is a truly alien ecosystem here in the very, very deep, cold ocean. You can come back here another time, take the tube down, and explore down there. I'm going to swim around the hub and over to the cold water coral. This is another coral reef. It doesn't look anything like the tropical coral reef. What do you see here? Yeah, some of the species are bigger, yes, which is interesting. And some of the species that you cannot see at all are much smaller. Yeah, the, the, uh, the feathers are, they're not feathers, they're animals. But they look like feathers. So the, the, uh, And they're not, they're not rooted. And th by coming in and out like that is how they collect food. So these essentially tentacles are capturing, again, the detritus because they do the, they're white or gray or pale yellow or so, they do not have the uh, symbiotic algae. So they have to capture food that flows by or food that happens to fall on them. They still have the, yes.
I had to look a lot. I had to search, yes. I had to search for this. But there is somebody who seems to like corals and the things that the tube worms and the other things that live in this kind of a habitat. Um, and, and so I was lucky. Otherwise, I would have had to make them myself. Yes, but you do have to search. There is no one producer, no single producer. And then the, a lot of times you will see in Second Life that people are building um, scenes that they believe are artistic or you know, aesthetically pleasing, but they are not realistic. So here we have things that would actually live together in our solid world. A few of these creatures have been produced by a uh, someone in Japan specifically for this site. Some of the the um, marine mammals. But most of these things you can find around if you know what to look for. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So there are a couple of uh, critical things here that I want to mention. One is that the discovery the uh, and research into cold water deep sea coral reefs is very recent within the last few decades so we've always suspected that there were some because uh storms would uh, get loosen some of the the critters and they would float and die at the Top. And so uh, sailors have always seen some, but we didn't know about any of the sites until very recently when we have been able to use submersibles and when we've been able to use some of the more sophisticated radars um, to map the, the bottom of the ocean. So in that vein, they have found so far a few of these deep water, cold water coral reefs in the Mediterranean. Not many, a few. So they are, this is an ongoing research. There probably are more. Um, they have found a number of them now off Ireland, John. Um, and in the Norwegian Sea and along the, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. They knew that there were some on the uh, uh, continental shelf, but they didn't know that there were deeper ones. Yes. So um, I have a little bit more on those areas over at Stem Island attached to the Science Circle. But the other thing I want to make sure to mention is that these areas, even though we know so little about them so far, are under extreme stress. They do not survive in hot water. So as the water heats and the water becomes more and more polluted, they become more and more stressed. And yes, it is polluted. They have found that particularly the plastics 
that are um, disintegrating in our oceans and in our air. The microplastics have settled in the less disturbed areas of the ocean floor. And so these corals that are surviving on detritus um, are also ingesting microplastics. Not good. Um, the whales that you see around here, the blue whales, the enormous whales, um, are um, baleen feeders. That means the baleen is not teeth, it's kind of a, a like fingernails, but uh, filters. So they open their huge mouths and suck in whatever is there that then let the water out but keep the, the tiny organisms. And some of those tiny, many of those tiny organisms are copepods. Copepods are very, very, very tiny marine creatures that live primarily in cold water. And we didn't know until recently, but the, the fields, and I say fields because they uh, stick together in the millions, billions probably, and they float up and down along the water core with the, the sunlight. And so a little bit of warmth and they rise up and then they sink down again. And then they rise up and they sink down again. And so not only does this provide food for the whales and many of the other creatures, but it also um, churns the ocean water and it releases oxygen into the atmosphere. This is a very important oxygenation of the atmosphere for us. Who knew? What's happened though when the waters of the Arctic and subarctic, waters of the Antarctic and uh, near Antarctic have warmed up is the copepods are not as fatty. They do, they, with the cold, very cold water, they take, they build up fat. These tiny creatures are, you know, like tiny fat bombs. If they are not as fat, two things happen. They're not as nutritious for the whales and the other creatures that eat them, but they also are less capable of churning oxygen. They don't have the mass. So less oxygen is released. We're again back to the whole notion of systems and thinking in systems. Um, that one small thing you might not consider as extremely important, but it is. And along with the warming water, you will see crabs here. You will see um, <clears throat> some of the, the king crabs and snow crabs that are in or were prevalent in the uh, cold Arctic water. These populations of crabs are crashing. And I mean really crashing. They also have, they always have some growth of the population and some uh, subsiding decrease of the population. But a few years ago, 10 years ago, maybe the king crab population crashed and it went from a very lucrative um, fishing um, source to the beds were closed and no fishing was allowed. There were so few. 
the last couple of years, the snow crabs have crashed. And I don't mean a little bit of population has crashed. They were, snow crabs were in the Bering Sea in the billions, billions, tens of billions. La two years ago, they weren't finding any. So this year they finally figured out and they didn't know what happened to them. This year they figured out that with the warming water in the Bering Strait, in the Bering Sea, that it was too much for the snow crabs and their food sources died out. And somewhere between 10 and 20 billion with a B snow crabs died off in five years. So this population has crashed. Will it come back? Nobody yet knows. So the warming of the atmosphere is related to the warming of the ocean, is related to the food sources that we have available. Uh, this is all interconnected. So yeah, it's interesting and it's pretty, but it is also related to our own human survival. Yes. Yes. Yes, we, I am done for this part. Uh, if people want to come back, uh, please come back. If you have questions, do reach out at any time. If you have a group of people who want to come back, let me know and I would be glad to meet you over here if I can. And I, I love having your classes here. It's, uh, re I really appreciate you all coming.